All right, amen. If you have your Bible, turn to the book of Acts chapter 16. I hope you have. The, scripture, the Bible is called the sword of the Spirit. Word of God, Acts chapter 16, verse number 25. Acts chapter number 16, verse 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises to God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors opened, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Father, bless your holy word now. Anoint the messenger and anoint the word as it goes forth. In thy righteous name I pray, amen. I don't know of a more important question to be asked anyone. No, I don't. That's the most important question you'll ever ask yourself or anyone else. And everyone must give an answer to that question. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? The answer was forthcoming. Very quickly they answered him. And they told him in verse number 31, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. I told you Matthew, Mark, and Luke are what's called the synoptic gospels. Synoptic. One view joining together. And so therefore the scholars like to classify things and they classify Matthew, Mark, and Luke as synoptic and therefore they cause you to look upon John like it may, may be an odd thing or does it really belong? Does the Gospel of John belong in the canon of Scripture? There are those who say it doesn't. There are those who say that the Apostle John was uh, somehow or another out of his mind out there on the Isle of Patmos and that what he wrote does not complement Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, they'll do anything they can to attack the veracity of the Scripture. Believe me, they will. And, uh, and so doing this, they cast doubt in your mind and make you wonder. But the Gospel of John is the last Gospel written, probably about the same time as the book of Revelation. The kingdom of heaven had already been offered to the Jewish people. They'd rejected it. The kingdom of heaven to be preached on this earth, the Sermon on the Mount, and all of that had been rejected long ago. And the Apostle Paul, in the last chapter of the book of Acts, had turned to the Gentiles and said, They'll hear it. And he shook his garments. And he said, Lo, I go to the Gentiles, and they will hear the gospel. Then he quotes the book of Isaiah, chapter number 6, where the Lord told them, Seeing they see not, hearing they hear not, and God has hardened their heart, lest they believe not. And he has a reason for that. If you'll read Romans chapter number 11, you'll see the reason. That God closed it off for these people that he might have mercy on them later. So now the shifting is toward the Gentiles. The focus now is toward the Gentiles. Not just Gentiles alone, but Jew and Gentile. But the Apostle Paul said, I'm in debtor both to the Jew and to the Greek, to the bond of the wise, the free, and so forth. He knew that. The gospel of Christ is to all mankind. But it is no longer the focus of the preaching of the kingdom of heaven where it says, go not into the way of the Gentiles, go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. No longer this. And so therefore, John writes his gospel, and his gospel is not directed toward the kingdom of heaven and the Jewish people per se. His gospel is directed toward mankind. The gospel of John is the only of the four gospels that mention the new birth. John's gospel is the gospel time and time and time again that drives home the point that you have eternal life by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel of John in John chapter number 9 is clearly as it can say the Lord Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Don't ever let anybody flim flam you and tell you that the New Testament, that Christ never claimed to be the Son of God. That's hogwash. 
That's a man that's ignorant. He doesn't know what he's talking about. But of course, the new Bibles, a lot of the new manuscripts like to change that because they like to attack the deity of Christ. The Gospel of John is written that you might be born again and that you might believe and that you might be saved. And it's not talking about you being brought into the kingdom of heaven. It's not talking about repent and be baptized for the remission of sins that you might receive the gift of the Holy Spirit referring to the Jewish people in Acts chapter number 2 on the day of Pentecost. What the Gospel of John is about is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. So therefore, the focus now is toward faith in Christ because Christ our Lord the Lord Jesus Christ is not only the Savior of the Jew but he's the Savior of the Gentile he's the Savior of all men the Bible says clearly now when you get to the book of Acts you're looking at a time span a chronology when you start in the first chapter go all the way through the last chapter of the book of Acts there's a progression taking place and I'll show you that tonight it's very important to understand this, if you'll follow this progression, it'll begin to open up God's manifestation of himself and his word to his people. When I get up in the pulpit today and I preach the gospel of Christ, I preach how that Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. Where is that? 1 Corinthians 15. The apostle Paul says, I declare to you the gospel and that is as plain as it can be. There's not a word in there about baptism. The Apostle Paul told the church at Corinth in chapter number 1, he said, I came not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. There are those today who cannot make a difference between this baptism and they make it part of the gospel. And this is why I'm trying to show you the dispensational progression of the New Testament. That's the only way that you can understand what's going on. The New Testament is not written like a textbook where you can sit down in a classroom and just open it up and it takes you progressively from one point to the next. What you have to do is pray for the Holy Spirit to enlighten you, to open your heart and teach you these things. The scripture says, search the scriptures. The scripture says, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he'll guide you into all truth. So at Philippi, the Philippian jailer, According to the day and time, if these people had escaped, his neck would have been on the chop block. It would have cost him his life. This is why he was ready to commit suicide. Because he knew he was going to die. Yet God had intervened for a reason. There was a purpose in what's going on here. Not only was the purpose to bring these apostles out, but it was to hand to you today the living word of the living God so you can see what he said. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? That's a simple question. A lot of people ask that question today. What can I do to be saved? I get emails every day from people who say, Preacher, what can I do to be saved? What must I do? This one said do this. This one said do that. This one said that I must, I must, I must exercise some penance. This one says I need, some, I need to be baptized. This one says I need to keep the commandments and live a sinless life. This and that and this and that. What must I do to be saved? And the Apostle Paul made it plain. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. The Bible says in the book of Ephesians chapter number 2 and verse 8, and you're all familiar with this, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If you take grace away from it, there is no salvation. Grace brought you to Christ. Grace gave you faith to believe in Christ. And then grace saved your soul through Christ. And it was all by grace. Unmerited. Nothing you could do to earn it. You're not good enough for it. The lie of the devil is, well, I've got to get myself straightened up. You know, if God's going to accept me, I mean, I've got to do some changing for God to accept you. No, God has accepted Christ. And if you will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you have been accepted in the Beloved. Amen. Satan wants you to point, wants you to look at yourself, and God wants you to look at the Son of God, for that is the Savior. So the apostle says, "By grace are you saved through faith." He, in other words, he's giving you the means of salvation. For by grace, Titus chapter number three and verse five says that not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Well, there's the water. Don't ever get caught up into the idea that every time you see wash, you think water. Look over here in Revelation chapter number 1 and verse 5. 
And I'll show you a place where you're washed and water has nothing to do with it. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and did what? In what? His blood. There's no water. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Now I'm going to leave it at that, at that part of it. And let's look at baptism. Look at Acts chapter number 10, verse 44. The book of Acts is a transitional book. The book of Acts has people doing things from what they understood. And God shows them, smack in the middle of it, a new revelation. He shows them that there's more. That, they're only, that they only understand a certain amount. Because it's a transitional book. A classic example is when Apollos was at Corinth, knowing only the baptism of John. Priscilla and Aquila went up to him and instructed him further in the way of the Lord. You see there? Apollos was a good man. He was preaching everything he knew. He was preaching the light that he had. But there's more light now. And he accepted it. How, why did he accept it? Because he had the real light to begin with. He was a true and faithful disciple. Look at uh, Acts chapter number 10 and verse number 44. Now, this is important. This is very important. You know the Apostle Peter. He was not what you would call an evangelist to the Gentiles. <laughs> I mean, he wasn't about to set foot inside a Gentile home. As far as he's concerned, that, uh, that was unclean. But God showed him how that you don't call unclean what I've cleaned by letting a sheep down. In chapter number 10 of Acts and verse number 44, And while Peter yet spake these words, now watch this, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished. Now who are these people, the circumcision? They're Jews. Now watch this. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished. And as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentile, dirty, low-down, stinking, goying dogs. Yeah. On the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now watch this. Watch this. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. All right. So up to this point, does it look like God has done something with these Gentiles? Certainly he has. Look what follows. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? Now wait a minute. You don't get the Holy Ghost until you're baptized. You don't get the Holy Ghost until you go into the water. I heard a man say the other day, you don't contact the blood until you contact that water. That's sad, isn't it? It really is. Well, what's going on here? All right, remember, in Acts chapter number 2, Acts chapter number 2, men and brethren, what should we do? Come over here and let me show you. Acts chapter number 2. Look at this. Acts chapter number 2. Acts chapter number 2. And verse number 37. Acts 2, 37. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Who are the we here? Jews or proselytes. Then Peter said unto them, Acts 2, 38, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Okay? Now there are a lot of good people out there, well-meaning people, and that to them is the gospel. I just read you the gospel to these folks. Now, wait a minute. When we get to Acts chapter number 10, the Apostle Peter is ready to start preaching this to these people. He's ready to start preaching it to the Gentiles. But before he can get it out, the Holy Ghost falls on them. They start speaking in tongues and they haven't even been baptized. It completely blows up Peter because he had intended to preach this to them. Well, didn't he know the difference? He was learning the difference. What do you mean by that, preacher? Look at Galatians. 
hadn't planned to go here, but let's just look at this a moment. Galatians. Chapter number 2. Verse number 11. But when Peter... Now believe me tonight, folks. I love Peter. And he's not going to get mad at me for saying this. <laughs> we'll show you what's in the book. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I, Saul of Tarsus, apostle to the Gentiles, that's his calling, Ananias, he is a chosen vessel unto me to carry my name, my message to the Gentiles. All right? But when Peter was come to Antioch, where is Antioch? Antioch is the first place that they were called Christians, north of Jerusalem. It was a Gentile area. And it was Antioch where they were called they of the way, and then they were called Christians by their enemies. All right? And so when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. Now you have a direct confrontation between two apostles. Is Peter an apostle? Absolutely. Is Paul an apostle? Absolutely. Verse 12. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with Gentiles. In plain words, Peter had begun to understand that Gentiles were part of the body of Christ, that they could be brought in. He learned that over there in the book of Acts. For before certain came from James, James was one of the leaders of the church in Jerusalem. All right. This makes him a leader of Jewish believers. Were these Christians? Yes. Were these Jewish Christians? Yes. But they hadn't been brought out of Judaism to the point where they understood that faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is not just another branch of Judaism. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is for all mankind, not just Jews. In plain words, you don't take a Gentile and try to turn him into a Jew to make a Christian out of him. This is what the, the Hebrew, works, uh, uh, Hebrew Roots Movement is trying to do today. This is what a lot of people out there are trying to do. They're trying to mix Old Testament Judaism with Christ and with Christianity. It won't work. Look what Paul said to him. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with Gentiles. All right, one time he did. But watch this. But when they were come, they came from James, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision, the Jews. He was intimidated by Jewish Christians that were trying to hold on to laws and, uh, and, and some of the other things that accompanied Judaism. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him. Why? Because Peter is a figurehead, folks. <laughs> There's only one Peter. And they're going to follow Peter. Maybe they say to themselves, well, God has showed him something else. He's had another revelation. Whatever. And other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch as even Barnabas was carried away with their dissimulation. Barnabas was never the leader you know who the leader was? Saul of Tarsus. Paul the Apostle. Look at verse 14. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the what? There is a mixture and Paul said, no, not one speck of it. I said unto Peter before them all, if thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We who are Jews by nature, and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but how? By faith, by faith, by faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Amen. So this is the classic confrontation. Well, what happened later with them? The apostle Peter referred to Paul in his epistles, in Peter's epistles. And he talked about his brother Peter, his brother Paul. And he talked about the works, his writings, and he said they're scripture. 
That's what he said about, about Paul. So whatever rift, whatever rift was, had developed here was healed. And the two men, because they both believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter is an apostle. And so is Paul. They're genuine apostles. They have the same Holy Spirit. So the time is going to come when they must unite together in fellowship in the Lord. And they did. And in the fact that they did prove that they were both genuine apostles. But the point is very clear. The apostle Paul, when he was saved, was taken off into Arabia. He neither, con he neither consulted with flesh and blood. He was taken into Arabia. Some think that he was taken to Sinai. You can't prove it one way or another, but it sounds good. <laughs> because where did Moses get the law? Sinai. So why would God not take Paul and take him to Sinai? That's Arabia, by the way. Take him to Sinai and take him to the very spot Moses got the law and say, Now here, Paul, let me show you something. And what he showed him was the foundation of the church of God and the essence of the gospel of Christ and who the Lord Jesus Christ is and what he accomplished on the cross. And when Paul came back down out of that mountain, he started preaching Christ and him crucified. He preached the cross like nobody had ever preached the cross because he defined it. He explained it and applied it to the people. Therefore, he's the apostle of the Gentile and wrote the biggest part of the New Testament. It offends me. When somebody comes along and says that the Apostle Paul is a perverter or a distorter of the truth of God. And we've got these guys out here everywhere doing this stuff now. All over the internet. Blasting the Apostle Paul. And what they're doing is blasting a big portion of the New Testament. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? The answer, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Well, preacher, I've always believed in Christ. No, you haven't. No, you haven't. You may have always believed there was a Christ. You may always have believed that he did wonderful things and performed miracles and maybe even rose from the dead. But that's not salvation. That's not salvation. Look over here in the book of Romans chapter number 10. Now you know that the book of Romans is about justification, redemption, propitiation, salvation, all these big theological words that have a direct bearing on our relationship with God. And he even talks about the mercy seat in the book of Romans. He talks about God blinding Israel, Romans 11. And talking, he talks about how he turned to the Gentiles. In the 10th chapter of the book of Romans, so many times, you've done this yourself. If somebody comes down to be saved or something, you'll turn to Romans 10, verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You, you pray with them here in the altar or at home or wherever it might be. It makes no difference. Everywhere you put your foot in the, in the age of grace is a holy ground. <laughs> there are no holy spots. But anyway, <clears throat> in Romans chapter number 10, he opens up a perspective on this to show you what must you do to be saved? Brethren, verse 1, My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel, they might be saved. For I bear them record, they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. Well, who, what is the righteousness of God? That's right, a person. All right, verse 4, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. The just shall live by faith. The just shall live by his faith. That's right. In the Old Testament. But the faith that I have now, the faith I have in the Son of God was a gift from God. But let's go on. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart who shall ascend into heaven. That is to bring Christ down from above. What's that mean? Who can ascend into heaven? Could you do that? I can't do that. Only two people on this earth were ever taken from this earth unlike anyone else. The first was Enoch. He was translated that he might not see death. He's a type of the church. Translation, the rapture of the church. Then Elijah. He goes up in a chariot of fire. These two are caught out of the world, caught up in the presence of God. <laughs> I can't imagine what Elisha thought as he saw him leave out. It's quite a thing. Next thing Elisha saw was his mantle that he left for him. 
that prophet's mantle. So what does it mean? Well, who shall ascend into the mountain of God? Who can come before the presence of the Lord? Well, let me say the answer. It's a, it's, it's, it's a rhetorical question in the sense that you ought to know the answer. The righteous one. The only way you can ascend into the presence of a righteous, holy God is to be righteous and holy yourself. Amen. Do you know any man that could do that? No. no. No human being is capable of that. I don't care the best man that ever lived. You can't do that. There's only one. Amen. Only one. Amen. Only one. And he did. When Jesus Christ, our Lord, came out of heaven, he came out of heaven as the second person of the Trinity. The angels watched him as he came down, unaware probably of a lot that's going to happen. The second person of the Trinity came down to the earth. But when he arose from the dead, the God-man ascended back to heaven. The man did not come down from heaven, but a man went back to heaven. That man that went back to heaven is the Lord Jesus Christ incarnate as a man. There he is in heaven. So therefore, the righteousness of a man... This is, the, this is the key to this. How many of you believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is righteous? Amen. How many of you believe that he's always been righteous? Amen. There's no question about that. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, incapable of error, incapable of sin. They're always, always have been holy, holy, holy. Righteous, right? Amen. That's not who he's talking about. He's talking about a man here. That's the key to this. He's talking about a man who walked this earth just like you do, who lived where you live, who hurt like you hurt, who was tried like you're tried, and in the end, who can convince me of sin? He was perfect and pure. And so that righteous one ascended to the right hand of the Father. Do you believe that? Now this is where he's pointing your faith. You see, this is where your faith is going. Look at verse number 7. Or who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring up Christ again from the dead. What's that mean? Well, who can descend into the deep? Who can say, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. I yield by my authority my Holy Spirit, the ghost, my spirit, my life, gone. Body in the tomb, dead. The body of the Lord Jesus Christ for three days, dead. If you'd gone into the tomb, you would felt his body, no pulse. Dead body. But he's not there. Where did he go? He went into the heart of the earth. Don't you think he took a chance by going into the heart of the earth? That's Satan's domain. You remember what happened over there in the book of uh, Jonah? When the whale swallowed him? He said, the gates of hell, the gates wrapped themselves, the seaweed wrapped itself. He said, I was shut up and shut in. And he said, I cried out to God. Job, and not Job, but Jonah is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know how I know that? What did the Lord say about Jonah? As Jonah was what? And three nights... In the belly of the whale. Now don't let anybody flim flam you and tell you that a whale can't swallow a man. God can put a whale out there that can swallow this building. That's junk. Why do, you, why do people nitpick around foolishness like that? Good night. The Bible said plainly prepare to fish for him anyway. But as he was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so must the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, right? And he heard him. For he cried out to him, and the bars could not hold him. They couldn't because there was no justice in holding him. Satan had no authority over him, and by his righteousness he arose. And if you want to know the truth, they probably breathed a sigh of relief getting rid of him. <laughs> because he didn't belong there. Amen. You know Satan doesn't like to be around righteousness too much. No, I'm talking about real righteousness. So the apostle says over here in verse 6, But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, Say not in thine heart, Who shall ascend into heaven, or who shall descend into the deep? But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy brain. 
That's not what it says, is it? Intellectual assent, preacher. All you got to do is believe the facts. Everything's okay. He's cool. <laughs> just believe. Just believe the facts, man. You're all right. No, 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 no. Your heart's got to get involved. Verse number eight. What saith it? The word. In other words, the word of confession, salvation. The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, he's Lord, and believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, and be baptized, thou shalt be saved. So you're wrong, preacher Lawson. All it says is that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. I'm wrong and the Bible's right. Amen. That's all. Belief. The Greek word is pistuo. We don't use that word today. It's a Greek word, but we translate it as belief. But not only as belief, but a lot of other words. Forty-nine times. Forty-nine times at least, and maybe more, because there may be some interaction going on there in the Gospel of John, written 90, 95 A.D., 49 times believe, 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 believe. Over and over again, John emphasizes the necessity of belief. This word, pistuo, means to put trust in, faith in, put yourself into, take hold of, embrace. Only you know when you do it. I can't stand over you and pronounce, well, you said all the words. You prayed the sinner's prayer, man. Let's get on with it. You're saved. No, you're not. Don't ever let anybody flim flam you like that either. Don't ever let some man pronounce you saved. It's between you and God. It's as personal as it gets from your heart. Do you want the Lord Jesus Christ to be your righteousness? Do you want what he did to be your justification? Do you want what he did to be your propitiation? That means appeasement. That means that you and God are at peace now. You know what he said in 2 Corinthians 5, don't you? God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed to us the word of reconciliation. Be ye reconciled to God. He put an olive branch out there and said, Here. On my side, my son, satisfied, my anger, my son, satisfied, everything I had. I looked upon the travail of his soul and I was satisfied. Now on your part, will you be willing to accept what I've done for you? He becomes that. Notice that I haven't pointed you one time to something you do, something somebody does for you, something you pay, somewhere you go. Something, something that has to do with some kind of religious relic or religious thing or, or, you know, pilgrimage or something. Everything I've said tonight points to a person. A person. A person. Have you ever really trusted that person? That's what this text is all about. Have you done it? And this is what pistuo means. That you put your faith in a person. Have you done that? The Apostle John said, these things are written that you might believe. Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. That's intriguing, isn't it? Think about that. Many other things he did, and they're not recorded in this book. You mean there are things that happened that the Bible doesn't know? The Bible is not exhaustive in some areas. There's a reason. God apparently saw there's no reason to tell you everything he did. But the Apostle John says this. He says, but these are written, what you've got, this gospel, that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. That telling you plainly why he wrote the gospel. That's why it's written. That's why it's attacked. That's why the liberals love Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And they hate John. That's why it's different. It's not different because God pits it against one against the other. No, sir. 
Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are all beautiful, God's word, and they're in the scripture for the reason. But men like to make a difference. What kind of life does he give you when he saves you? He said, I give unto them eternal life. John 10, 28. Watch this. John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have what? Everlasting life. Isn't it amazing how that this gospel written to the Gentiles, last one written, talks about the new birth, is the one that puts all the emphasis on eternal life? Are you following me there? Think about that. John 3, 36. He that believeth in the Son hath everlasting life. John 4, 14. Whosoever drinketh the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. John 5, 24. I say to you, he that heareth my word, believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, shall not come into condemnation, pass from death into life. I listened to some folks last night, as sincere as they could be, and they said, we pray at the end of our life that we will be justified because we have lived the kind of life God wants us to live to show Him we have faith in His Son. No! No! You're trusting your works, what you've done in this life. And that's not saving you. John 6, 37. All the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will what? In no wise cast out. Boy, that's good. That's comfort from God. Because I may go loony. <laughs> a month from now, I may say, you already are, preacher. Well, you know, it depends on who you talk to, whether you pucker or duck, you know. <laughs> but I'm happy. <laughs> I'm happy, happy, happy. <laughs> I know I'm saved, and I know whom I have believed. But I could, yet any of us could. Go plumb off the deep end and come and visit and say, my goodness, what's happened to the preacher? I mean, he's crazy. But I'll still be saved. John 6, 40. This is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son, believeth on him, may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up. John 17. And this is life eternal that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So the Gospel of John emphasizes his deity. The Gospel of John emphasizes belief in Christ. And the Gospel of John lays it out plain, eternal life that you get. And the Gospel of the John is, is, is the one Gospel that says, you must be born again. That's John. That's why they hate it. That's why they hate it. Because people are self-righteous. That's one of the hardest things to get men out of. Did you know that? It is. It's hard to get yourself out of it. It really is. Why? Because you're proud. Say, I don't have any problem with pride. Oh boy, don't you? <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> no, I'm very humble. Yeah, we know you are. <laughs> we all have a problem with pride. Amen. Amen. And pride is fed or feeds self-righteousness. And self-righteousness is a wall between you and God. Not my righteousness, not having my righteousness, but the righteousness of the one who went to the cross and died for me. And when he arose from the dead and ascended to the Father, he ascended by his own righteousness. And when he came into the very presence of that holy being, God the Father said to him, Lord, have a seat. <laughs> The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand. Lord, God, have a seat. What you're looking at is an interaction in the Trinity. And it's quite remarkable when you read the New Testament where God talks to God and the Old Testament. And you look at that and you think, my, what are they saying to each other? Because they know ahead of time what they're going to say and why they're saying it. But they're saying it so you know about it. God's talking to God. My, what a thing. Has the Father accepted the Son? He's fully accepted the Son. He's completely accepted the Son. Any doubt in your mind about that tonight? All right. So what's your salvation tonight? Exactly. Do you really believe that, though? Well, I believe you do. I mean, we got, I believe we've got a house full of believers. Well, maybe there's some in here that aren't. You're unsure. You really haven't, you've been, you've been led through the sinner's prayer. Folks mean well. I mean, they do. They mean well. 
The meaning well won't get the job done. Have you really believed? Do you really believe? Are you trusting? Are you embracing the Lord Jesus Christ? <laughs> I walked over here one time. I had this thing on this on the back of this house over here. I was wiring this house up, and I had the had the wire the the panel open, and I wasn't paying any attention to what I was doing. I walked around the corner, and that thing was right at this level. <laughs> And I walked around there, and I turned around, and bang, that thing hit me right between the eyes. Do you know what I did? I said, oh, Jesus, Jesus, <laughs> Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And it just calmed down. That's the first one I cried out to. Amen. Hit me right between the eyes. They came up to me to put me out, and the anesthesiologist looked at me, and he said, now this and that, and this and that, and this and that. I said, everything's okay. And they took me into the room, and I walked. In, I went in that. They rolled me in on a gurney. And the last thing I saw was this nurse coming at me with this mask. And I went into that room, and here came this mask. And that's the last thing I remember. But I know I had a name on my heart as I went into that room. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Doesn't matter what goes on in here, what happens. Jesus, Jesus is my future, my hope, my salvation, my love, my life. Jesus. There's no other name like Jesus. Bless his righteous name. At the name of Jesus. Love him from all of my soul and all of my heart and all of my being and everything that is in me. All that I'm made of. Anything I ever hoped to be or ever was. It's in the name of Jesus. Do you know that name, folks? I'm not trusting the Baptist church to save me. I'm not trusting the catechism to save me. Jesus. Jesus, there's no sweeter name. Father, in thy holy name, bless your holy word. And I pray, Father, I've laid this out tonight as simply as I know how. I pray you'd take it, Lord. I pray you'd put it in the hearts of the people. May they think about it. May those who watch this thing, watched it now, watch it later. May it be a, may it, may it be a way that they understand the simple truth that salvation is of a person. And faith in that person, that person saves their soul. In Jesus' righteous, holy, sweet, blessed name I pray, and for Jesus' sake I ask it. And amen, 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 amen. Jesus, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they that what? The book. Jesus.